Hi there, I'm Wendy McCallum, burnout and alcohol coach and wellness expert, and you're listening to Bite Size Balance, where everyday extraordinary women share their stories, expertise, and wisdom, all in the name of lifting each other up and creating a better life by design. Whether it's wellness, career, relationships, food, alcohol, mindfulness, hormones, or parenting, we talk about all things women's balance. If your life looks great on paper, but it still feels like something's missing, you're in the right place. Welcome to Bite Size Balance. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the second last episode of season two of Bite Size Balance. It's been such a great season. I wanted to come in and do a solo podcast today. It's going to be a short one, but I thought it made sense to reflect just one more time on what I have learned in the last year of being 50, because if you recall, the season opener for this season was me talking about how I had just turned 50 and I actually recorded the podcast on, on that day. And I had some nervousness around what was to come for me and what it all meant. And I was just sort of at the point where I think my hormones were starting to level out from going through menopause at age 49. And I was struggling with the transitions that I knew were coming for me in terms of my children, both graduating this year and moving on to university and probably leaving our home and all of that. And I just realized that I'm just a couple months away now from no longer being 50 and being 51 and that I will not be recording a podcast probably on my 51st birthday because I'm taking the summer off as I did last year from the podcast because I can. That's one of the wonderful things about running your own show literally is that you get to decide whether you take a hiatus in the summer, which I'm going to do again. So I I just wanted to come in and reflect. I also know that I have talked a bit on this podcast about one of the things I've discovered this year that's just been amazing for me, which is that I really, really love to write. And I thought I would share a piece today because this piece that I wrote is, um, is very much reflective of the learning of this last year. So I thought about just talking um, and it felt silly because I already have this all down in a really kind of concise way um, in this piece, which may end up being a chapter of something if this thing ever gets published. But um, for now, it's just a piece I wrote that really I've shared with no one except for the handful of people in my writing workshop um, that I'm in. But I thought it might be a good thing to share with you today because I think hopefully it'll resonate with you. I mean, it's my perspective as a 50-year-old woman in midlife who is going through or has gone through a lot of the same things that I know that you are all struggling with. So um, I hope it just makes you feel less alone and maybe gives you some hope for uh, what's possible for you. Because the thing I think I have discovered in this 50th year is that the thing that's been the most powerful me is that powerful for me is this real understanding. And this is going to sound ridiculous because you're going to be thinking to yourself, Wendy, for, for goodness sake, we just assumed you knew this. Um, because you're a coach and this is what you do for a living. And I do know it. I just didn't know it was true for me. I didn't necessarily believe it was true for me. And that's this idea that we are actually in charge of our own lives and we get to decide what happens next. And if things aren't where we want them to be, we get to change them. And this year has been a year of great transition for me and it's not over. I'm looking forward to what's coming next. I have, um, as one of my oldest and, um, dearest friends said to me, uh, I have, uh, I've really embraced my weirdness and the quirks that maybe I'd been repress, trying to repress and push down, um, the creative pieces of me that, uh, haven't had a, had, I haven't had any space. I haven't given them any space for the last 25 years. And I've decided to rebrand my weirdness as my magic and, um, and just to go with it. So I hope that this podcast just pr- gets you thinking about what is it that you want for yourself? Because I just want you to know so badly that you get to change things. If you're not happy, if you feel like something's missing, you get to change it. And it can be really scary and it can feel kind of overwhelming, but sometimes you just need to feel that fear and take a step. 
And I've been doing a lot more of that in the last couple of years. And I'm telling you, it's been paying off. It's paid off in so many different ways. And this little piece that I'm going to read for you now is, um, I think is demonstrative of that. So I hope you enjoy it. We'll be back with one more episode, which will be I'm hoping a final episode with Sarah, uh, Dr. Sarah Bailey, because I like to start the season and round the season out with her. She's become one of my very dearest friends and um, she's got all kinds of exciting stuff happening in her own life in terms of stepping into personal responsibility and recognizing things aren't where she wants them to be and making some changes. And that's really cool. And I'm hoping she'll come, come on and talk to me about that. And we'll be able to have that conversation be our season closer. But for now, I'm going to stop rambling and instead I'm going to move to this piece that is called taking care of me and I hope you enjoy it um, I don't profess to be the world's best writer but I do really enjoy the process it gives me great joy to write and it's also been very helpful to me in terms of helping me process some of the things that I've been feeling in the last couple of years okay here we go taking care of me in the two decades after the estrogen kicked in and my identity became inextricably tied up in nurturing, I excelled at superficial acts of self-care. I ate veggies most days and exercised when I had the time. I booked a biannual massage and rarely missed a yearly pap smear. I took vacations a couple times a year and only worked for part of them. And I was very good at giving myself what I thought I needed, like a new purse, three hours on Sunday to train for my half marathon and red wine on tap at night. These things provided the quick fix I wanted and that all important check mark next to self care, but it turns out they barely scratched the surface of what I actually needed. I can see now that my self care was mostly about what made me look good and rarely about what made me feel good. It was about scraping by and keeping up appearances. It was about not ruffling feathers or disappointing anyone. It was about taking care of expectations, not about taking care of me. The more I did, the higher my value climbed. Productivity had become my currency. I was running myself ragged during the day with all the list making and nonstop doing and tamping down my resentment night after night with boxed wine. All of this to quiet the noise and get off the hamster wheel for an hour or two so I could get up and do it all again the next day. All of this just to keep up with the other working moms who I now realize were also barely keeping it together. Just like you, I fell for their curated Facebook feeds. I too dreamed of recreating those impossibly aspirational moments they were peddling. We get to a point where not doing enough starts to feel like not being enough. Slowing down feels like failure, like admitting defeat. I worried if I stopped, I might never start again. Also, if I wasn't doing, then I'd just have to be, and I had no idea how to do that. I was under the misapprehension that self-care was easy because it involved giving yourself things like pedicures, decorative pillows, and bubble baths. But I've come to learn that meaningful self-care is actually very hard because the most important bits involve taking things away and saying no. No to the weekend work project. No to the brownies for the bake sale. No to the teenager's request for a late night ride after an endless day. No to the impregnable instinct to drown yourself in a bottle of Malbec. No to the bullish urge to bury yourself in a bag of chips or under a pile of sweaters in an online shopping cart. No to the feral instinct to run like hell from a hard conversation. Like you, I was much better at saying yes. I was raised to be a helper and to be polite at any cost. No felt rude and wrong, so I had to find other words to bridge the divide. Words like, let me think about that, and can I get back to you, felt easier. In the beginning, saying, I promised my kids I'd do less this year, felt better than saying I promised myself, so I went with that. Over time, I let more go and took on less, and it felt good, so I kept going. True self-care is also figuring out what you need more of. It's doing the inside work you've put off for years. It requires getting clear as to what's been missing, what you set aside, and then taking it back, even if there's a cost, because there will be a cost. It's lots of little daily practices and sometimes bigger, more radical acts. Self-care required me to choose the hard of teaching my children how to do more things like laundry and meal prep for the easy that came with their growing independence. I discovered that what I really needed was to take time away from mothering, ask for more help, even if things didn't get done the way I would have done them, slow down, care less, and create things, even if they were worthless to anyone but me. To get down to the business of taking care of me, I needed to step into personal responsibility and get back in the driver's seat. This was my life after all. What did I want? Whatever it was, one thing I knew for sure was that no one else could give it to me. My first radical act of self-care was leaving a well-paying job I was very good at, 
but that I knew deep down would never fulfill me. At the time, leaving felt like a cop-out, but now I see that I just took a courageous chance on me. It took me another decade to take care of my next biggest need, entangling myself from alcohol. And my third grand gesture of self-love happened almost accidentally when I stopped drinking and stepped off the scale forever. When I started my alcohol-free experiment, not drinking was all I could think about. I read books, journaled, and listened to podcasts in every free moment, and frankly, felt so good that I forgot about the fact that my weight was my worth. I was so happy to be alcohol-free that the thought of letting an inanimate object take that inner peace away was terrifying. In hindsight, I can see that I not yetted myself to freedom from the scale, just like I'd done with alcohol. Every day I thought about stepping on it, I played the tape forward. What would I make the number mean? How would that serve me? And by saying yes to the scale, what was I saying no to? Spoiler, it was confidence, joy, and that thick buttery oat cake I'd already earmarked for my mid-morning coffee break. Have I gained a little weight since I kicked the scale to the curb? Probably. But I've also lived through two years of a pandemic and the bumpy ride of menopause. My clothes still fit and I'm stronger than ever. And most importantly, I'm content. The job, the booze, and the scale were the three big things I needed to say no to. But I knew there were also some things missing, things I needed to say yes to. I had a feeling I needed something creative. I tried a lot of crafty things, but nothing scratched the itch like that first writing class. Even though it didn't always come easy, and it took me weeks to drum up my courage and months to find my voice, and even longer to call myself a writer, the writing itself always felt so good. It was a way to lose time. I'd look up hours later and realize I'd forgotten to eat or even stretch my legs. It became clear to me that I'd officially become a writer at 1.48 a.m. on a Monday night. I woke to my husband snoring and had the random thought that I should write about the way I always kick him in the same spot on his shin, then retract my foot and freeze so he thinks he woke himself up and turns over. Other women will probably get that, I thought. I need to write about that. At a time of night when I'd religiously beat the crap out of myself for drinking, I was now thinking of pithy phrases and resonant topics. Instead of Googling, am I an alcoholic? I was slipping downstairs to add ideas to a running list of things you think of in the middle of the night. The fact that I'll sacrifice sleep, not to lose a metaphor, tells you all you need to know about my hierarchy of needs. I'm a writer, and I think I always have been. Sometimes self-care is recognizing that what served you once may not still serve you. I'd put my own career in a holding pattern after my kids were born. But in those 18 years of mothering, my husband built a very successful company. I needed to know I could also build something I was proud of. But I'd been taught to be humble and modest, and that clashed with my desire to succeed. How could I hold myself out as an expert on anything? Wouldn't that imply I was better at that thing than everyone else? What if they thought I was arrogant? How could I charge what I knew I was worth? Wouldn't that look greedy? In a final act of radical self-care, I did the hard, terrifying thing. I doubled my rates and narrowed my niche, owning my expertise around midlife burnout and drinking. My business tripled, which meant I got to help three times the women. Taking care of me helped me take care of them. It had also become clear in recent years that I needed more women in my life. For years, my kids had been the platinum sponsors of my social life, keeping me well-connected through their many activities. I was grateful for the fact that our house was a place they were comfortable gathering and especially loved it when they let us join the party. But they were pulling away and their childhood hobbies were naturally wrapping up as they readied themselves for college. I no longer found myself in the crowded bleachers for hours as I waited for her to dazzle on the carpet or bundled under a blanket rinkside with the other hockey mums while he tended the goal. I'd also noticed that my not drinking had led to the natural shifting of some of my friendships. It turned out that booze had been the glue that held a few of them together, and for others, it was a necessary lubricant. Without it, they either fell apart or felt awkward and empty. Finding new friends at 50 is hard work, but it's also self-care. I took some chances and got back in the dating game, inviting women out for coffee or walks around the reservoir, and it paid off. My coven of sure-footed and free-spirited crones is growing by the year. For the first couple of years after I stopped drinking, I was hungry for anything that had to do with personal growth and sobriety. I needed to hear about the transformations. I rooted for the underdogs because I felt like one. But I don't need podcasts and self-help books anymore. I know what I want. I know what serves me and what doesn't. And I know how to take care of myself. I walk without headphones most days. Maybe that's because now I like being with my own thoughts. I'm no longer afraid of what I might tell me. Here's what I've learned. You don't have to listen to the story, even if it's true. You always get to change the ending, whether you're a writer or not. If the story's not serving you, you can find something truer that does and practice living that. 
and you can give yourself permission to lay the suitcase down. You know, the one that's heavy and makes joy hard and peace impossible. Whatever's in there, you don't need it anymore. It's never too late to be who you always were. Thanks everyone for listening. I will see you back here next week with Sarah. That's my hope. I'm trying to manifest that. I haven't booked her yet, but I'm going to find her. I'll track her down for you guys. I hope you enjoyed that. You probably noticed that some of the themes in that piece are things that Sarah and I and other guests have talked about in the last couple of seasons of Bite Size Balance. And it's really been for me such a joy to host this podcast and um, and just to get the feedback that I get from you, that the topics that we talk about are really resonant for you as another busy woman in midlife, trying to create something magical for herself. So have a wonderful day. I'll see you next week. You've been listening to Bite Size Balance with your host, Wendy McCallum. As a burnout and balance coach, I help busy high achievers like you create a more balanced, joyful life. Ready to create a life you don't want to escape from? Download your free blueprint for change now. This incredible workbook includes some of my favorite coaching tools and will help you get clear on what you need more and less of in your life. Grab it at www.wendymccallum.com forward slash blueprint. That's www.wendymccallum.com forward slash blueprint.